and going strong. It's a different kind of startup to the ones that you're in because uh, it's an agency. We were profitable from day one, which is always a good thing to be. But hopefully, we can give you some advice today to uh, to, to bring your ideas to profitability and how to go about that. Over the David. And uh, a little bit about me. Um, so I now run an agency called Digital DNA, and its focus is purely on advising um, startups and growth stage companies that are involved with data and media. So typically in the music, movie space, and how they can use data in a way to either personalize the service or get some data analytics about what people are doing. Um, and within that, I, um, I'm, I'm working for about six different companies at the moment, um, one, one of which is um, owned uh, by Peter Gabriel, but some of the uh, people more at my age will know as a music Musician. legend. Um, and, uh, and the younger ones are going There's two people that know who you're talking about. <laughs> Um, so, so we, we work, we, we're working on, on uh, media and the data that you can attach to media to apply it, to give it some meaning. Um, so, meaning tags, you know, meta tags for, for media. Um, we, we built an entire dictionary for this, and uh, the applications that are going to come off it are either educational applications or um, games. So, the first thing we're doing is launching a game called Picky Pick, which is all about guessing uh, the meaning of pictures and videos based on. Um, what you're showing to you. So, so that's one of the projects. I work also for a company called Visual DNA that do psychographics. Um, so they take what pictures you click on on the internet to work out what kind of person you are, and then they sell that data to the advertising, um, to the DSPs, the advertising platforms, so that they can better target you um, with advertising. And I also advise, uh, another thing I do is advise a trust, um, a trust fund called the Nominate Trust, which actually um, gives money to startups if they can um, develop technology that has a positive social impact, so typically on um, social problems, educational challenges, etc. So that kind of gives you a bit of an idea. And before that, because I've been doing this for one year, before that, I was CEO of a, of a technology startup for five and a half years uh, called The Filter, which was a personalization engine. Um, and it powered things like Walmart, uh, Orange, um, Warner Brothers, NBC.com, Dailymotion. So wherever you went into there, where there was video and music, um, we would provide the recommendations and the personalized recommendations. So that's my, my background. And then before that, I was working in media. So that's why I think I, I know a little bit about media and a little bit about data. A little bit about doing that. Um, but today, I'm not going to talk to you about data, really. Um, we're talking, talking about uh, innovation. Hopefully this will work. This will work, yeah. So uh, I guess one thing I haven't mentioned that I do a small amount of is I teach um, at an MBA school in Bath in the United Kingdom. And Bath is um, probably the third best MBA school in the UK, not the first. Um, but it does have a very strong international um, following. And uh, there's, a, there's two weeks that they do at Bath in the MBA, which is called the Entrepreneurship Week, where they put all the students into groups and they have to build basically businesses, real business, business ideas, and, and they, they enter them into a competition to get, um, to get a grant. But also in some cases, if they come from outside the UK, they also win business visas, which are very important to them to stay and then develop their, their, their ideas. So the, the little thing I do in there is I do a, a module called um, Disruptive Innovation. And so what we've done here is we've combined some of the stuff, some of the theory that I um, teach, <laughs> I don't really teach, that I talk about at, at Bath, with um, some of the practicalities um, that John's going to bring. Yeah, how to make a bit of money. Yeah, that theory. kind of practicality. <laughs> yeah, 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 to pay for the MBA. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, what, what is innovation? Now, uh, my start point is always three or four definitions for anything. Um, it's a standard start point. Um, and I, I've looked for definition to the United States and to the United Kingdom, um, but uh, so, so, so the ones that I've come up with in terms of the UK, this is the UK uh, Department of Trade and Industry, which is the development of new ideas, and the, the innovation, sorry, is the development of new ideas and their economic application as new products or processes. Um, the word processes is really important in that, and I'll, I'll explain why later. In the, in, in the United States, there's a couple of different um, official 
definitions of innovation, the implementation of new ideas that create value. Um, and again, value is a really important point. I think we're going to be stressing the point of, of building commercial value. And um, the second one from the United States is a little bit more wordy, but it's the intersection of invention, because invention and innovation are two different things, the intersection of invention and insight that leads to the creation of social and economic value. And then I have my own little definition, which um, for me is simpler. It's just simply innovation is a profitable implementation of ideas. Uh, you can all have your own, I'm sure. But I think the key, the theme here is always um, it has to create value. It has to be profitable or has a commercial value. Uh, whereas an invention, an idea, can be just an idea without any commercial value. It, you know, it, it, might, it might have value in itself, but it's not commercial value. So why is this innovation important? I, hopefully I don't have to ask you guys this because of um, what you do and, and why you're here. But um, I will talk a little bit about why it's important. Um, innovation, you know, we, we know that very successful strategies get copied. Um, so if you, if you do one thing very well and then you just stay like that, then you will get, and, and it's very successful, you will get copied. You know, there's no, there's no doubt about it. And when you get copied, what happens is I always have to have a picture of a cat, by the way. That's the rule in every single presentation. If you do anything about the internet, you have to have a picture of a cat. Um, because the internet is run by pictures and videos of cats. It's actually run by cats. Yeah, run by cats. Um, so what happens when you get copied is your margin, your profitability gets squeezed because you have to then compete on uh, price and you have to compete on uh, other things like that, which, which mean that you, you get squeezed. Um, and so my point is that without innovation, you don't survive as a business. And I think um, what this isn't so good for children. I don't know if you can see it so well. It's you know it's using a shopping trolley as a barbecue. It's a good idea. Um, without you know without innovation, your business the business does not survive. And the thing is though, what I'm going to show you is that big businesses that are in established markets are designed to fail in the long run because they cannot innovate. Uh, and I'll explain to you why, which is why there's so much opportunity for startups. Um, so, you know, innovation is good. Um, why is it good? Well, it creates growth, it increases productivity. You know, these are all the good things that you will have our prime minister and, 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 and you know, presidents of all these countries saying uh, it increases the economic wealth. Uh, avoids stagnation and, uh, and provides actually a good thing for consumers. Innovation provides better goods um, and services, usually at a cheaper price, because people are finding better ways of doing things, more effective ways of doing things, using technology to take steps out of processes. Uh, okay. By the way, four of, four of the principles you mentioned on the previous slide has nothing with uh, like positive impact. Uh, growth is not always good. No, I agree. I agree. Economic something is just economic something. That's a very good point, and and this is why the point about um, you know one of the definitions that I showed you one was about not just um, commercial um, value but social value, and you could you could translate some of these points to instead of profit to social impact. Um, this is very much targeted. Um, at the commercial value side of things, because that hence why we talked about disrupt, innovate, disrupt, and make money in this case. But I, I, I would agree. With, I think that's another sort of another tangent to, uh, to talk. Some words for the definition as legally or ethically. I mean, depending on the context. Sure. Yeah. So I made a point earlier about invention and ideas not being innovation until it has a value, whether it's commercial or social. Um, and uh, you know, that's, that's quite important in thinking because when you, you guys, I uh, say so you guys, when you're talking about a startup community, if you, sorry, if you, if you, if you, if you, if you talk about ideas and inventions, um, you know, you can spend a lot of time talking about those and, just, and, and that's very important, but at some stage you have to decide, is this, does this have commercial value? Um, does this idea, this invention, um, have commercial value, and, and you know, I would argue therefore that not all inventions necessarily have commercial or social value. Um, and I might be wrong about this. I would argue with you. I think that one absolutely is a winner all the way. <laughs> I might be wrong about this. How many people would buy this products in the room? 
No, just me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but John's got John's got, got three babies. They so all need it. I could use them all to clean the floor at the same time. <laughs> that is a more effective, effective cleaning system. Um, so yeah, not not all invention uh, actually can classify as an invention. And um, you know, we've just spent two days at the Happy Farm Business Incubator, so that you'll understand this this analogy. But an invention, an idea, as as an egg. Um, you know, it, it's, it's fine, the laying of the egg, but we just know quite simply that without the uh, incubation and hatching, which in effect is, is the innovation part of it, um, and the innovation is about looking at the processes that you can improve, the steps you can take out, um, that side of things will make the idea, the invention, become, it will hatch into a living thing, you know, to a real thing that has value. So there's, there's, I have this little diagram that shows the process where you go from um, having an idea with a discussion. We, I come from England, we spend a lot of time in the pub. And in the pub, we, um, before, when we were allowed to smoke in the pub, we used to have ideas that we called uh, fag packet ideas. Now, fag, in, not in America, fag is a dumb thing. In England, uh, it's a cigarette pack. And fag packet is a cigarette pack. And we would always talk about ideas that you could put on the back of a cigarette pack. Uh, or on the back of a beer, of a beer mat. Um, so, you know, when you have some idea, a little bit of an idea or something you could change or some new idea, for me that's what we call basic research. Um, you know, you, you, you sat in the pub, you had a drink and you go, you know what? Why don't we put, why don't we make babies clean stuff when their baby grows? Brilliant idea after five pints of beer. Um, so that then moves you into maybe doing a bit of research um, into, the, into the idea and you enter the invention stage and actually you might even build a prototype or you might, you know, you might actually start making it. Can this thing actually work? Um, now the key stage after that is, is working out whether um, there's actual commercial value and this is when you start looking at um, talking to potential customers or looking at businesses you might be uh, disrupting with your product or your service and seeing whether uh, it is actually feasible to do so. Can you take away this step? Can you make it free and will people go for it? And can you make value out of it somewhere else? So that's the innovation side of it. And if you're successful, if it is genuinely is, has created some kind of value, um, the next stage is that it, it gets diffused, it gets distributed, this idea, and it's successful. And then all things that are successful, either if they're consumer things, they get picked up and, um, what's the word? I adopted, thank you. <laughs> I can't see it all over there. Um, they get adopted by consumers, and back to my picture of the little chap copying over his friend, they get copied by consumers, and, all, and you go all over again. So, um, this is coming into the more theoretical side of, of, of what I talk about within um, disruptive innovation. Um, but it is useful to think a little bit about, maybe if you're working on a startup, a uh, new business idea, where, where you place your, your idea, your innovation within this grid. So what we have uh, at the bottom is what we call domain definition, which is the understanding of the market, the domain you're in, and whether that is well defined, whether it's well understood, well developed, and everything to the right is more developed than to the left. And then the, uh, the other axis is about the problem definition, which I'm sure, I'm sure when you, know, you have your own business, people have asked you, well, this is a good idea, but what problem are you actually solving? I'm sure everybody at Happy Farm knows that. That's what you know, we ask. What problem are you solving and for whom? And you go, oh, well, we're solving the problem of babies walking around not doing anything, and so they need to clean, right? So, okay, that's just solving that problem. Good. Um, so that's the, that's the second axis, which is actually, can you define the problem that you are solving properly? And, and so, you know, the different types of innovation, in effect, go into here. So the basic research I showed in the original, that goes down here, bottom left. The domain and the market is not that well defined. The problem is not that well defined. You're doing basic research. And typically, this is the area of academia. Um, or people in pubs. Um, then you've got the, um, the hardest thing to possibly do, which is uh, a market which is not defined. Um, but a problem that is defined, and that's what's called breakthrough innovation. And it's really hard to think of examples of breakthrough innovation. Um, some people might say social networking, Facebook is breakthrough innovation, and you could, in a pub, have a long argument about whether that is um, just disruptive, um, because it's disrupting the nature of talking to each other, 
of texting each other with another form of communication. I don't know, it's, it's an interesting conversation. Uh, the two areas I'm, I'm interested in here for the sake of this talk is the other two, which is sustaining innovation, which is when the market is well-defined and the problem is well-defined, but you find ways to do things slightly better. And the fourth one, which is disruptive innovation, which is where the market is well-defined, but the problem is not so well-defined. So you might be able to develop a new technology as you look for new problems um, to, um, to, to solve. You know, um, it might be that YouTube, when they started, um, they were kind of going, well, we know people watch video, but what they didn't know is, do people want to share video of cats um, falling off sinks or on skateboards? But now they know that that's, you know, that is definitely something that people want to do. Um, so I have a few examples here of what, what is sustaining innovation and what is disruptive innovation. So this, um, we all know, you know, Gillette starts with one razor blade, and what do they do every year, 18 months, is they add a new razor blade. And actually the picture I originally had was photoshopped and it had 20 razor blades. It was much cooler. I should have done that one. Um, so this is, this is classic sustaining innovation, trying to keep your market by just making a few changes that are good enough um, to get there. But what, you know, what a new roller thing which takes off all your hair for a week and suddenly that's disruption, you know, and that's, that's, that's a big change. Uh, I think that might already exist. Uh, oh, waxing. Waxing, thank you. Quite so. Um, you guys, you know Ryanair, I don't know if Ryanair flies into the Ukraine or not, but um, uh, it certainly is a, it's a, it's a low cost airline. So. Um, and this is not sustaining um, innovation, this is disruptive innovation. So for very many years, the uh, state carriers, British Airways, Air France, um, etc., they basically kept on adding, they were sustaining, they were sustaining innovation, they were adding, oh, let's add some, a new um, cabin called First, uh, after business we'll do First Class, and there we'll do, we'll do beds, and we'll do like chefs and massages, and, and we'll charge more. And, um, and, meet, and, then, and then these guys come along, up here, Michael O'Leary comes along and says, you know what, we're going to look at every single aspect of the process of taking people by plane from A to B, and we're going to change it so that we can take people from A to B for $20, or for very, a very small amount of money, in some cases for $0. So we're going to look at how we're going to do it. So they stripped every, every bit of weight uh, from, the, from, the, from the chairs. They're, you know, the chairs can't move back, so there's no little button if that's gone. Um, they got rid of one of the three people in the cockpit. There usually always was two pilots and an engineer. Get rid of the engineer um, because we'll do the checks on the ground. And they, you know, they also got rid of the free food. They thought, you know what, we'll just charge people for food. And that's basically they looked at every aspect. They got rid of the booking system. There was no way to book flights other than through the internet. And so they said, you want to go on right now for twenty dollars? Get online. I don't have, a, I don't have a computer. I don't care. Get online. Um, so that was, that was very, very disruptive. And actually, um, once they came on board, um, the main carriers had to completely change how they did um, travel. And then there's this, um, you know, my, my, I guess my favorite one, because I used to be a photographer, I'm not really, my, I, I, I have fun, but I used to do uh, music photography, um, is, is the whole story of photography. You know, there was the days when I was young, where I used black and white film, and I had my own dark room, and I developed my own pictures. And uh, the sustaining innovation that this industry delivered was actually, they went, you know, we're gonna give you different types of film, which is more sensitive and better, um, better ISO rating and better coating, and, and, and that's gonna be cool. And then, um, instead of going to your own dark room, you're gonna be able to go to Walmart or to a supermarket and get your pictures de developed uh, overnight, and then it went from overnight to within one hour. Brilliant. And does everybody, anybody remember the one hour thing? Okay. Um, and then also the prints were not just simple prints that became that you could start uh, getting books and postcards, and so there was all of these different things you could do with your photographs, and that, that was pretty cool. But that was all sustaining innovation, and then, you know, behind the scenes, bit by bit, there was this new technology that was coming along, um, which was just simply a way of storing um, images on these little things. And, um, and that basically completely disrupted, uh, not immediately, but it bit by bit completely disrupted the photography industry. And, um, and then the other thing was the fact that we could print our own pictures at home. So we're all used to this, but that was a major disruption. 
Um, and uh, I, I don't know the exact, I don't know enough about the big names like Kodak, etc. But I'm pretty sure uh, they're either out of business or they they went through a chapter and then they're like, so yeah. Okay. So, they tried to become a printer company and they failed out of it. So. Okay, um, so that's, that gives you an idea of, of disruptive innovation, hopefully. The, the ingredients, this is a little slide about if you are in the business of innovating from a disruptive point of view, so looking at existing um, things that you can change, um, then these are the ingredients that you need within you and your team um, to be able to do this, which I'm sure you all have. Um, but they're really important ingredients, and this is another reason why big companies fail, is they don't have these sort of ingredients within their teams. You know, you need, you need to be very curious, you need to, to be open to diversity, because actually, if you're very close to diversity, you don't see some of the things that you can change. Um, you know, you need to have a lot of faith and confidence in um, just trying stuff and, and, think, and thinking um, that, that actually what is happening today, what is the, what we call the status quo, can, can be changed. Um, and you know, you, you, you need to sort of, um, I guess the most important one is, is the one down here, and you've probably all been told this, you've got to be prepared to fail. You've got to, you've got to have the will to take the risks and prepare to fail, because I don't know what the stats are, but it's probably something like eight or nine out of 10 fail. So you know, let's fail and learn and, do, and get up again and do something else. So innovation where it matters. I talked a lot about at the beginning about processes and how you look um, at t attacking existing businesses, how you build your own business by attacking existing businesses. It sounds like I'm very aggressive. I'm not aggressive at all, but it's... Uh... So you, you have to look at the process, which is um, what the company does to turn basically four main things into value, which are um, the inputs. The four main inputs any business have is labor, so people. Um, it has uh, capital, investment. Um, it has uh, information, data, business data, and it has uh, materials frequently. Um, sometimes it doesn't have materials if it's completely digital. Um, and the process, which is this big, big processing machine, is actually the business. It's the business that works out how to make all these things into something of uh, a greater value than, um, than the inputs. So, because if all those inputs are more expensive than the output, then that's, that's not profit making, right? So, um, and the reason I point this out is that you can um, either improve the processes or you can change any aspect of the inputs when you're looking at disrupt. Um, you know, when I talked about Ryanair, they improved the processes. They decided that instead of taking three hours to turn a plane around, they're going to do it in 15 minutes. And they worked out how to do it in 15 minutes. Um, I, can't, I, I don't know enough about the airline industry to know how, what, what elements they took out, but I, I assume they took out engineering checks, so they only do them once in the morning, once in the evening, so they don't do them when they turn around and play, whereas British Airways did them every time, and they felt that was secure enough. I know, and there's a whole bunch of things that they took out of the process. So I'm gonna talk a little bit briefly now about, this is, this is like the, the high-end theory, and if any of you are very interested in innovation from a theoretical point of view and case studies, I recommend uh, this chap, Clay Christensen. Uh, he's, he's written a book called The Innovator's Dilemma, and inside that book, there is a number of case studies, but the one which is the most, um, the, the, the sort of is, is like, a, like a rock through the, through the whole book, is the case study of um, the hard drive industry. So a long time ago, back in the 60s, computers ran off hard drives that were, I think, 16 inches in diameter. And, um, there's a bunch of companies that came along to build hard drives for that size, and their customers said, these, these are good hard drives, but we need the hard drives to have more space and to be faster in terms of read write And the company said, okay, we'll do that. And meanwhile, what they didn't do is, is um, innovate in terms of something very simple in terms of the size, the physical size. So what happened is other companies, other engineers came along and started building eight inch, or 12, I think it's about eight or 12 inch, I can't remember the next one down, but smaller size hard drives. And the big companies, the market leaders who are making millions were going, we're not gonna do that because there's no market for it. Um, but actually, when they built these things for cheaper, um, they suddenly found that a market came along because these 16-inch um, these hard drives were for supercomputers. But uh, what they needed was uh, mainframes came along and they needed smaller hard drives in terms of physical size. And, uh, and so 
that got, they got disrupted. The market leaders all died, and these new ones came along. Now, the funny thing about the case study, and I'm not going to go into the detail of it because it can get quite lengthy, is this happened five times in the same industry, from 16 to 8 to 5 and 3 quarters to 3 and a half inch, um, and then we now have, like, I don't know, some of you will know better than me, but the hard drives you can have in phones, and uh, they're just like flash drives are tiny, right? And each time, the companies who are leading died because they did not innovate, because they did not anticipate that there was a market. And the reason I'm giving you that example is I can then talk about the five, um, I guess, key learnings that, uh, or rules of disruptive innovation that Clay talks about. The first is, because companies depend on their customers and their investors for resources, they have to focus on the needs of those investors, of those customers. So if the customers are the mainframe computer, and not these, these upstarts that are doing, not, sorry, the customers are the supercomputer and these upstarts doing mainframe, they're not going to worry about what they need. They're going to ask their customers, what do you need? And what they need is, we need more storage space and faster in and out. And that's all they would focus on. They wouldn't focus on smaller size. And it was the same for uh, with a desktop computer, the companies that delivered um, five and three quarter inch, they didn't think about the laptop and, no and, the, and the notebook computer because they thought that's, just, that's going to be for small numbers of people, it's not us, and they were wrong. So that's... I want to raise customers from this slide because there are a lot of startups that became companies without financing from the customer from zero point. To yeah, no, I'm talking about companies who are established. Not startups. So this is this is the rules about why big companies get disrupted. This is not this is not about startups um, how they how where they start from. Because I, I, I agree, you, you, you don't, a startup does not necessarily have customers at the beginning. So, but big companies that are well established listen. If they're doing their job properly, they listen to their customers because that's what you teach them. It's like you go to them, yeah, listen to your customers. What about the jobs? Uh, well, Steve Jobs is absolutely one of the key exceptions. You're absolutely right. Because he was prepared, and uh, it, uh, I don't know how many of you read his book, the, bio, the biography, um, the official biography, but you just realize how many risks he took for potentially killing um, parts of the Apple business to actually bring a brand new disruptive uh, innovation. He destroyed his most profitable business to create a new one. Yeah. yeah. What has been on your slide from this corner? On this uh, Windows 8 one, slide. <laughs> I understand. Take, take your risks and move away. Yes. I mean, it's, it's about innovation, not about, you know, British Airlines business. It's all about risk. Oh. It, it, it is, yes, yeah, yeah, it is. It's a new market. It is, but the risk, so, so you know, British Air, Airways didn't take the risk. Ryanair did. They took massive risk. They, they bought 20 aeroplanes. To, to, and they didn't know if people were going to buy the product, but they did buy the product. So there was a massive risk in the process. Um, so, so absolutely, it's all about risk, and, and there's a lot of there's a lot of failure there. But the point of these rules is about the rules that, that it's saying that uh, the theory behind this and the case studies are that you every big company, no matter how powerful they are, have a soft underbelly because they are designed to fail in the long run, the big companies, which means that for smaller companies and startups, there is opportunity across all industry. This is, this is the point of it. So, you know, the second rule is that small markets, so to a company um, like, um, well, British Airways, there we go, a company like British Airways, small markets don't solve the growth needs of large companies. So their, their needs will be, we need more revenue and more profit. And actually, they said, our European short haul was not profitable, it's a small market, why would we even worry about these guys from Ireland who are deciding to do low cost? Because all we're interested about is business class flights to America. And so they didn't think it was, it was important, which meant they got disrupted, you know? And small markets at the beginning, every, every innovation is, is for a very small market, and sometimes it's for a non-existent market. Um, and so big companies don't look at non-existent markets, other than maybe Steve Jobs. Yes, yes. There are some exceptions. And Richard Branson. You forgot Virgin Airlines. In between British, British Yeah, British it was a disruptive. The same strategy, yeah. but with better branding. Yeah, I think that was more of a sustaining innovation rather than a disruptive one. But yeah. 
So um, third one is that, that again, you know, these small markets or markets that actually don't exist can't be analyzed. Now big companies, what do they have within, within their finance teams? They have large armies of analysts who can go and analyze markets. And they have to present to boards why they have to invest $10 million in this idea. So they can only um, propose and can, can only analyze ideas that they can actually put an ROI to, a return on investment to. Very hard to do if a market is so small that it doesn't exist yet. So big companies, again, find it very difficult to, um, to analyze and to understand the, these new market opportunities. Um, the fourth rule, or rule, yeah, the fourth conclusion, is that actually a big company's um, strengths or their capabilities often define their disabilities. And, you know, it could be an interesting debate on the Apple thing, but without Steve Jobs, um, is Apple now actually their strengths of um, one single product, um, say in the phone market, which is where they were, um, and that, that approach, which was their capability, which defined a lot of their profits, and I'm not saying they're doomed or anything, but is that starting to define maybe their disability? And is that why we're starting to see um, different SKUs, so different versions of a product, because they're realizing that, that the market they're competing with and Android is, has several different um, firms with several different price points to allow for several different markets to come in. So it would be interesting to know whether Apple as an organization had this massive strength of one focus, one product, whether that's starting, now that they, they, you know, they're very dominant, but is that starting to maybe define where they might become soft, where they might become, there might be a disability in the long run. And the final um, very important conclusion or rule that Clay comes out with is that technology supply within companies that are looking at sustaining innovation um, comes to a point where it often overruns, outruns the market demand. Um, so back to my computer hard disk uh, example, um, whilst the companies that were doing the very big hard disks were focusing on better coating for the disk so it's quicker in and out and trying to get more um, more data onto the disk. Um, they did it so much so that they got to a point where they over uh, they overserved the market. The market going well. We don't need it to be that much faster. Actually, what we really need is now we have these smaller computers. We need it to be smaller. And they go, oh, we haven't done that. You know. So um, technology um, supply often because um, companies are constantly trying to improve on it will often come to a point where it becomes much more than what the market actually needs or wants. And that's where the opportunity again for disruption comes along. So, but um, just to, I guess, make the conclusions from Clay, from the theory of the uh, Clay Christensen um, uh, innovative dilemma, is that good companies um, seek to serve their customers, that's what they're designed to do, and serve them well. So that, this is one of the reasons why they are, um, you, can, you can actually disrupt them. Customers demand things to get better, faster, and more effective, so they focus on that. Um, but then companies improve their products so much that often they then over, over serve the market. And that's when uh, uh, maybe somebody that's been developing a new, smaller thing um, that wasn't really targeting the same market, and they've been doing it for three or four years, but eventually they then suddenly realize the market goes, well, hang on, that thing over there is way cheaper, and because I don't need this really complicated thing anymore, I'm going to go for that. And that's where you get market disruption. And there is a graph for market disruption, you'll be glad to know, um, which is this graph. Uh, and this, what this shows, oh, I've got a razor, um, is that this is the established company, and this is showing incremental, every, every little step, incremental improvements in the technology of the product or service they deliver. And this dotted line is, is what they're calling the performance of the technology that customers are you know, are prepared to utilize it, that, that's what they feel is, is good enough. So they do this, they do this, you know, they keep on sustaining this innovation, um, and, and the pace of technology progress is such that at some stage it actually goes over what the, what the market might want or need. And for quite some time, they might still be able to maximize that. But down here, what happens is you have a bunch of um, disruptive companies that might go, you know what, we're gonna do something way smaller, it's way crappier at the moment, like um, you know, YouTube's a good example where they came along and 
actually the picture quality was way crappier than what you'd have on your TV or in the, in the movies, and people were going, that's not going to disrupt because it's just not the same. But actually, there came a point, and and um, uh, you know, where technology has evolved so much that actually some people now are consuming an awful lot of their video, even their channels. BBC channels are on YouTube. I'm sure a lot of your channels are on YouTube, and they're starting to realise that actually that's that's good enough for the market. That's fine, and especially with a mobile phone. So this is the um, the sort of the sort of slide that gives you the graph of how um, main in a sustaining innovation for a mainline company and maps out to disruptive innovation and the point of disruption tends to be when when you when you can hit your market with uh, with what they're looking for. Um, so the point about this and now we move on to John is that this is an iterative process. Disruption very rarely happens like, you know, Mark Zuckerberg has an idea at Harvard, the next day he disrupts everything. That's not how it happens, you know. Um, actually uh, I think he started with a, a very much a hot or not sort of website was his first was his first attempt at Facebook, which was basically our girls hot or not at Harvard. So it's quite a quite a different approach, and and he iterated and iterated um, until before way before he managed to get to a point of um, of disrupting what was already there. So this iteration is um, what we believe is a key part of uh, the development of the process. It's a step by step process, and that is what we think is. A, is a, there's a formula in there to uh, to success uh, and to making money, which John's going to talk to you about. Thank you, David. So, so can I ask one question about the graph? Can you speak uh, a little bit about the sprout innovation after this hitting point? Because I don't agree that it goes straight into like this, and performance doesn't change. Why? Performance that customers can utilize or absorb. So performance is changing, but much more shallow, shallow. Well, no, but after such a mm -hmm. point, I mean, you're speaking about some basic performance or? Well, this is, this, is, this is technology performance within the sector that it is. So if mm -hmm. we're in the hard drive sector that I was talking okay. about, um, that, that is basically customers saying, we want slightly faster and, sli and, 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 and um, slightly faster disk drives with more um, storage. But, but then what they're expecting is fairly gradual. Meanwhile, the companies are providing them much faster. They, they develop at a much faster rate than the customers need. Um, you, can, you can see that within the phone industry. There was, there was a point where uh, you know, people were trying to develop all sorts of functionality onto a mobile phone, which was way beyond what actually customers were looking for. For a long time, Nokia was trying to um, give you a phone that was actually also a camera and a music machine. Uh, but actually at the time, which is probably over here, Customers were just texting and, and, and calling. That's that's all they were expecting. They were wanting to do. So that, that what what Nokia was offering them was not necessarily what they're doing. So that all this is saying is that the, the growth in the customer, uh, on average, the growth in the customer um, adoption of technology is much shallower than the growth in the technology that's being developed. Um, and in terms of the disruptive, what happens after disruptive innovation to the disruptive company? is once they become market leader, at some stage they become this, they become the sustaining technology unless they are maybe Apple or those few exceptions. But that doesn't the performance, comes away. Lower performance. It means you produce more than market can consume? Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's, that's that, you know, you could, even, you could argue that, uh, you know, it's a, that this, the same case that happened in social networking, um, that, 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 you know, they looked at the wrong things to improve. Um, so, so when you talk about performance, they look at specific technological advancements. It doesn't necessarily mean just speed or just um, you know uh, hard disk space or anything like that. It's actually you can call it features if you want. It's the it's the, the advancement of features. So R and D is uh, falsely oriented, I would say. Yeah. Research and development. Well, R and D is, is, is you know is down here. They try and they try and do R and D down here, but it's not necessarily disruptive. So I don't know. I think that's a Bigger. Okay, it's me. Um, you gonna click for me? I am. Oh, thank you. So, um, the formula. So, does anyone know who this young-ish gentleman is? No. Uh, so this guy is called Ev Williams. He is hashtag about to be very rich. He was one of the founders of Twitter. Uh, you may have heard last week they uh, 
they announced the IPO, which is probably going to be at a market cap of about $10 billion. And um, Ev is a little bit older than me, slightly, so I've, I feel I can still get there. He's probably going to walk away with a couple of, a multi billionaire pretty soon. But um, Ev gave a fantastic, he's not a very good talker, but he gave a really interesting, he doesn't talk that much, but what he does, you should listen. Pretty good talk recently um, about disruptive innovation um, and how actually it's quite pedestrian. It can be, it's, it's not necessarily as crazy, as exciting as, 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 as everyone would like to believe. In fact, there are many people running around Silicon Valley where I live right now, searching for a brand new innovation, an amazing new idea, whereas the real secret to money, to making to be a successful business, is actually small incremental changes, taking one step out and trying and getting into a business that's tried and true, but making it better. So, he, he spoke about the internet being a giant machine that's designed to give people what they want. And, um, and, and that is absolutely, that's absolutely true. I mean, I think that, uh, the next slide, um, you know, we often think that the internet enables you to, to do new things, but actually that's a bit of a, a fallacy. It's not, it's not doing new things. In fact, we've always done the same things. The internet's been around for 20 years, so 20 years, only in 20 years, what we were doing, what we've learned in that time, is actually all the internet does is, is enable us to do the same things that we used to do, but more conveniently. That's the trick. So we used to go shopping outdoors, actually two stores. Now we do it online. We used to go and talk to our friends and have coffee with them and maybe some drinks. Now we chat with them via Skype, Facebook, whatever. So it's a more convenient way. We've taken out certain steps. You've taken out the middleman. The internet is an amazing connection to, of course we know this, but it connects everyone, everything, every event, every thought, every like, every share, everywhere you are at all times. The, the thing that runs through this creates a multiplicity of connections that is exponentially grows enormous, but they all start to go in a specific direction, these connections. And the, the thing that overarchs, that the organizing principle above the, the, the things that connect you know, everything together, the overarching principle is what explains which business, which large business, or sort of which, which business either thrives or it dies, it lives or dies. And that is simply convenience. That is the simple truth to all of this. If you can make something more convenient than the next man, you will win. The elements to convenience are also pretty simple. It's, you know, people are lazy, right? They're lazy and they want it done now. They're lazy and impatient. That is just a, a fact of life. Especially, probably, you know, <laughs> probably more so where I live, but uh, they're increasingly impatient. But um, speed and simplicity, or speed and ease of cogn cognitive thought, you know, you don't have to think too much to get to where you want to be. Those are the key things to make things more convenient. So, when we look at, um, some of the some of the, the, the big so-called disruptors of our age, Google, Facebook, Apple, and Amazon, you know, the the the, the key elements that they did, they didn't start with an, an incredible an incredible innovation that, that was so new that the world had never seen before. Every one of these businesses disrupted the market. You know, so Google for example, you know, um, uh, uh, well in so many ways. I mean in, in, in search they disrupted in uh, uh, what else were we talking about earlier on? In advertising, yeah, in maps, for example. So, you know, we used to walk around actually looking at maps. You know, these days we have a fantastic app for that, you know, and also badly copied by Apple. But uh, Facebook, you know, we used to actually go and, and meet each other. We used to get on the phone, you know, but these days, of course, we can talk and connect by that. Um, Apple, I mean, has disrupted so many industries, but specifically, I think the music industry is one of the ones it, it, it destroyed the way that it was because it took out the middleman, it took out that you had to go to buy music from a, uh, you know, from a store, it took out, it, it, it destroyed the, 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 the way that we were A, being ripped off the music with the ease of, 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 um, of uh, buying music. And Amazon, of course, I mean, always two days before Christmas, I forget to do my shopping, you know, I can order it online and it's there the next day. So, you know, and virtually every, I mean, even where, where I live in San Francisco, you know, one of the key disruptors right now is seeing, you know, whenever you need a taxi, you just pick up your app, your Uber app, your Lyft app. I don't know if you have that here yet. Um, is it here? Uber app, okay. I mean, 
you know, everybody, it, it's, it's a basic human need that you need to get from A to B. And, um, and just to take out the disruption, to disrupt it by taking out one step of the process, by not having to phone a taxi, go through a taxi phone, wait for that cab or stuff, you know, by actually connecting a driver directly to the, 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 the customer and the payment is done online, there's no haggling of a price and application, credit card out. It's a really easy but disruptive innovation which is changing the way that we travel. So the secret formula is not really a secret. <laughs> to put it in, it's not really a secret, it's actually pretty obvious, but it's very important, I think, that we, we take a step back. 20 years of the internet has shown one thing, right? One thing only, that we, we are lazy, <laughs> very lazy. We are, hit, we, are, we are impatient, but we all, we all want to do the same things that we always did, but just in a better, more convenient way. So the secret that Ev um, spoke about, he expounded, is you take a human desire, and hopefully one that's been around for a long time, a fundamental human desire. You look at how that's been fulfilled today by the current business, and you use modern technology to take out steps, to take out the slide that David showed earlier about the process in the, in the, uh, in the, the food processor, you know, with, with the four elements to it. If you just take out one or more steps out of that process, that is the key way to be successful and to be the disruptive innovator right now. You don't have to think for the next big idea which is going to blow everybody apart. It's about incremental. Sometimes it's quite pedestrian and slow to get to this stage, but this is how to make money on the internet. And this is from somebody who I think is about to make a lot more money than we ever will. Maybe some of you might be bigger than him one day, but I tend to trust yeah. that. So, um, might a bit quicker than David's. I think we're, uh, we're through that. I think, yeah, I mean, it kind of, we tried to wrap up a little bit of um, theory with some practicality, and then to blow your minds with something that's blindingly obvious at the end. So, uh, do you have any questions for us? I think that's enough, enough time. Any questions from the audience? Come on, speak up. Hello. Yes. Uh, it's not a question. I would like to add a small thing. Uh, when we're talking about disruption, we use big companies as a bad example. So we're small, we can get around and make calls. But you see, the thing is, don't be fooled that you're small. Um, many of you will fall in the same exact situation that the big companies. And I've seen it many times. Uh, you, within your companies, you have ideas, you have like a uh, good developer, they never develop, they never work on one thing, they always have side projects. It's amazing how many people ignoring the, the side projects. And I've seen the situation when companies had actually golden, you know, peace within the company and they didn't even know that until the guy left. So my point is, Look at the big companies and don't do the same thing. Look around, look at the small ideas that you have, that some, you know, some guys that work in some dark corner that you keep there because he's somebody's relatives and you're just doing charity. I see the situation. The guy actually developed artificial intelligence this way. And I, I'm still sorry I couldn't use it because by the time I saw this thing, the guy just left for like year long vacation and people he worked with, they didn't realize that. Yeah. I agree, and actually the, um, you know, the case studies of the uh, hard drive industry, each time the development of the technology for the smaller hard drive came from engineers, from the market leaders, who were trying to tell their bosses, you should develop the smaller one, and they were going, we're not, and they left and set up their own startup and disrupted the company they would just been working for. Each time, it's been the same. So you're absolutely right. Yes. I have two questions. Uh, coming from financial sector, and uh, I find that because I mean the li latest slides you, you showed, it's about uh, fulfilling something better than it's now, and in many points I see the state is obviously the wall we should break or avoid or whatever. I mean we financial guys who had the offshore zone, money laundering, and using it nowadays, and uh, most of the even Skype, I mean, they use all these tricks and uh, cheatings. I would say cheatings because 
it's really uh, flowing money from the state where we are, not paying taxes on the grounds they've been based uh, and people are coming from. Outsourcing is also a bit of cheating because money flows, whatever, but they don't come to the destination point where it's right. I mean, you're coming from UK, but you're doing business in USA, but probably paying taxes in Cyprus, whatever. I mean, how, how do you think uh, this technology would uh, develop through Visa, through MasterCard? Uh, because you're coming from media, and it's mainly the, the issue is how to pay for the song in internet. How the guy sitting in the car in Ukraine would pay, and that's why Google Music is not here. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think, Big industries like financial industries, which have a fiduciary duty, a financial duty, and are governed by very strict laws, they take often longer to break, to disrupt, right? But it does happen. You know, you look at Bitcoin, for example, you look at new ways of, you know, you look at PayPal, new ways of ease of paying and, 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 and um, not having to go through, you know, the, the strict, the, the high prices, the high interest rates. Um, you know, I mean, look. If someone, people doing illegal things will do illegal things, it's up to the, each territory to govern their own and to, and to try to stop that. But innovation will happen in any industry and there is disruptive innovation. It's, it's financial, finance industry is, is a bit more difficult because it is so specific to each country and they all have different laws to, to govern it internationally. So there are tons of opportunities. I mean, you know, uh, all the time, you know, that, that there are new ways. It, you know, we see local banks opening up in, in America, you know, which cater to you on a personal basis because Americans were so sick and tired of phoning India all the time to get their information, right? So there are ways of just taking out a step or even adding. The thing is, sometimes disruptive innovation can be adding things that the market requires. You know, it's just it's just finding the right mix, the right balance, and and being there early. So, yeah, I just think I mean, there's a lot of things in your question because there's financial services and there's payments, um, which is obviously part of finances, but but the the entire online economy depends on some form of payment system. So I think there's that that has been a process that has been on. You know, there's been quite a lot of change, even um, just you know people are texting money to each other now in the UK using their mobile phone bills so they can take money from their bill and put it back on their bill and and so they're trying there's a lot of these sort of systems trying to and PayPal is kind of we're all used to PayPal now but actually when it came about it was quite a big uh, a big change to how we, how we did things in terms of uh, online payment systems fairly fairly secure online payment systems PayPal is not present in Ukraine okay well, you know, as, as certainly in the, in, the, in the big eBay territories, PayPal is the way to, um, to send money from individual to individuals. Um, so what I'm saying is that there are these systems that, that evolve because of the, um, the needs of the, the country. And, and there's no doubt that actually, you know, you can, the, disrupting the, the state and the walls from the state is, is, is going to come mostly from consumer pressure, I assume. But um, I don't have the answer to that, I'm afraid. Second question is about uh, competence level because uh, today we have like a bunch of the uh, workshops or a bunch of the presentations over the motivation. Make a startup, plug the last job, do your business, go out, break the system, and uh, go away. And uh, all examples coming from ahead is about the guys who are like, 10 plus years in industry, a lot of ideas that have been raised by the uh, employers and uh, they wanted to start up. Today we see the guys being 90 plus years walking in the co-working space or just in the kitchen of the grannies uh, or flat or in co-workers in, I mean, a lot of humor, a lot of temper inside, but I see that really people sometimes don't have confidence and they go to this walk, probably spending three plus years just doing nothing or doing something, but, I mean, this and things. Uh, what do you think about the competence? Can you describe or manage to mention some programs you use? You said that you have the best, but search best the MBA school for the UK. And what do you think? What is the best way to optimize this best from the perspective of your own experience? How to go this way? I think, I, again, lots of questions in one question. Um, but, um, so, the number three. Yeah, no, no, no. But, but there's a lot of interesting stuff in there. I think, 
Um, one, the, the, the point about it taking a long time to build something of value is absolutely true. And anybody in a startup, um, you get excited about it, but there's no doubt that the average from um, starting something and actually having some form of, um, uh, not even an exit, but some form of um, event where you might get some value from it is typically seven years. Um, and that's if you don't fail in the process. So it's, it's, it's not a short period of time to um, you know, hang around coffee shops. There's actually quite a lot of investment in it. So that's kind of on, on that side. Now the competent side of things, there's no doubt that um, with um, specific uses of technology, that getting uh, young, smart computer science graduates to solve a specific um, problem with technology can, um, even if they have no experience of building businesses, can be very valuable. But what you will find is that those people uh, tend to the ones that are successful at some stage quite quickly, once they've, they've, they've realized they've got something of value, they get somebody else in the business. And it's whether it's an investor, whether it's uh, they often call them whether it's a grown up, you know, these yeah. nineteen year olds go, we've got a grown up CEO on board. That's that's what happens is they get somebody with experience. Just as the example, competence. yeah, just we we just showed Ed Williams. He's not part of Twitter anymore. He still has substantial shares. He has grown ups running that business now. You know, I mean, so yeah. Same with you know uh, Facebook. Uh, Cheryl Sandberg. You see Mark's face, boss. but Cheryl really yeah. runs it. So. Yeah. She, she, she yeah, she yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, see, the problem is uh, psychology and culture. The thing is, in Russia, or I mean, I mean, when I say Russia, I mean Ukraine, Belarus, everything. We see we've been raised so that we do everything ourselves, and everybody I work with, they all has technical background. They all have their own ideas. They try to implement their ideas, and then. They do the, uh, the same thing. They all trying to become CEO and you know get MBA or whatever product. People, I mean, let uh, professionals do what they do best. You are technical people. You have ideas. You know how to implement them. Find somebody who knows how to run the business. Find somebody who knows what to do with finances. I mean, just don't try to do everything by yourself. It, it's not going to work. I mean. Yeah, there are situations when it's working, but usually it doesn't. And that's all successful people. If you realize what we are talking about, everybody when they show, okay, I have an idea, I did a proof of concept, I push the, I push the uh, business, and then I get somebody on board who knows what to do next. That's that's the right way. This is the easiest way then for you go get a second education, get an MBA, write 10,000 uh, 10, books about how to do business. You're going to waste time. Yeah, I, 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 and I'd also say, you know, um, the, the exit strategy should not, or, or the, the, the funding strategy of your business is, should, you should try to look beyond VC money or, or angel investment or, you know, there are so many businesses that you guys are considering or, or in the middle of right now where you could actually partner your way to, to, to be funded. You could be, you could be self-sustaining from a revenue basis by partnering up with other experts and other you know, um, um, uh, in uh, other businesses who who have a, have a, who have a non-competitive area that can help you get to the top. So, you know, yeah. I, I mean, just to, to answer, I, I do agree with you to a degree because I think once you have um, once once you have um, founders who have built a product and uh, have been able to focus on building the product, um, in some cases they then need help. Uh, they probably in all cases need help in some areas. That's when you bring a team in. But actually, you know, there are some, there are some um, good examples of product-focused uh, people who have not had experience, who still can have a very senior role and, and, and leadership role within the company. But there comes a time, even with, with, with the bigger companies, where eventually they do bring in people to bring in the revenue and people, people to manage the business. But um, I guess, I mean, I'm, 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 I've got two, two views on this, because I actually think from, an end, from my management perspective, I do fully agree with you, but I'm very much a product person, so I, I always believe that the culture of a business in its early days come from the people who, who dream and, and create the product, and that's frequently the founders. And so what you can't do is, is, is do it in a way that they're no longer making the decisions, and so you need a, a very sensitive, uh, grown-up manager that comes to help them rather than somebody that takes over. So I, I have 
kind of two. And there comes a point when they're a very mature company that it's all about taking the professionals and actually the founders should cash in and go and do something else. Yeah, the founder can continue this, but the founder needs to be ready to stop doing the work he loves. Yeah. Just a week ago I was talking to the guy and I told him, okay, you have two choices now. You have you reached a certain point of development in your business, so either you find a good manager and let this manager do the administrative part, or just stop developing yourself, just stop and do the administrative part yourself. But you can you can do both. You can't sit on both chairs. Very I don't want to be, can we see if anybody else has questions? Is it nice no, just the two of you all the time? <laughs> Uh, what would you advise to those who have a brilliant idea but don't have a team or don't have uh, enough funds to make it come true? Uh, I understand that there is a typical solution like finding a team, building it up and um, maybe applying to some incubator for, for some support. But is there any other efficient solution and maybe the cheapest one? Yeah, it's, I mean, I, so for founders with ideas that do not have technical skills themselves, yeah. it's always a bigger challenge than for founders that have technical skills. So there's no doubt that if you did some form of computer science or you, you, you have got an understanding of, of, of programming yourself, the early stage of being able to yourself build your product or your prototype is way easier. So there's no easy answer, I'm afraid, to this. I've, I've been asked this so many times by uh, by the MBA students going, I have this genius idea. No, I don't know how to build it. Is you have to find somebody who you can sell your vision to so they can get excited about it, somebody who's technical, and you have to get them on board so that you, you become a founding team. Yeah. Not necessarily find a whole team, but you need one, minimum of one technical person within the founding team. If not, you're gonna end up going to try and you know raise some funds to use uh, an agency to build your site not a good idea, you know, and so uh, my, my view is always is network um, within these sort of environments and um, if your idea is genuinely one that is, is gonna, gonna fly, you'll be able to yeah. sell that concept to somebody who will go, you know what, that sounds like a really good idea, I'm gonna help you at least develop the first bit of the prototype and you know, you might have to give them some equity or her some equity in the process, but it's, there's no, I'm afraid there's no easy answer that, the advice is always get a technical person on the founding team as much as possible. So is it correct that uh, you advise to find at least one person who I can sell this idea to and this person should have a technical uh, background and uh, that should be a good beginning, yeah? Yeah, they'll, they'll probably want more equity because they know you haven't got the skills to develop it. But, but you know, but share, you need to share at the beginning because you, you know, everyone has great ideas. Everybody has a great idea, trust me. And to actually make it reality, that, that's, where, that's where the magic really comes. Um, thank you. I'm Mavia, I love your presentation. But back to the topic, innovation disruption mm -hmm. and commercial innovation. Um, what would you advise for middle sized companies? Well, sorry, I don't have a lot of right? Um, but when the startup grows and becomes a middle sized company, what would you advise with what you give to such companies in order not to stop innovating and so not, in order not to end like? I, I'll start with that. And you, I, I mean, I think any business always has to have iteration and sustained innovation. So as soon as you've disrupted and you are on your path, you know, then you are the company to beat. You know, you still have to run as fast as possible, and you have to still have sustained iteration. There will come a point where your product serves no purpose anymore. I'm afraid it doesn't matter how much you innovate. There will come a point where. You have to either disrupt yourself with something else and be brave enough to do that, um, or just cash out and make sure you you know you've made the money while you can. But, but nothing lasts forever. So you know at that point, always iterate, but focus all the time. I mean, the key is to focus on what really matters and not over overkill it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think there's um, the, the piece of advice I would, I would give is, is I guess it's two parts. It's what is cultural. I think um, there's a lot of companies that are very aware of this of this issue. This theory that I'm talking about is not my theory. It's 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 kind of you know well established that big companies or medium companies can can be disrupted. So I, I know of uh, a small company called Facebook, which um, I've been to a few times. Lucky enough, I know a few people there. And there's a cultural thing within Facebook 
which um, which is very much from Mark Zuckerberg, which is we are you know we are only just starting. So everything about the company, even uh, their new fantastic campus that I went to, is never finished. The the walls are not painted. It's just uh, cement. And and uh, you know whether this is just gimmicks, I don't know. But, but culturally, he has got a really strong understanding about not, he doesn't want to be disrupted. He knows that. So he tries to get everybody to think. We've only just started, and 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 and, and we you know we are in the process of innovating. Now, so that's one example. There's one with the device that makes sure that your culture, even if you're in medium size, is all about never being satisfied with what you have, always being prepared to almost disrupt in the way you set yourself. Just to add to that, David, and and, and equally, you know, as many of you know, I mean, at Google, and on a project or an idea that has nothing to do with your job. So that's a cultural, enforced cultural, uh, you know, sort of a state of mind, which always means that there's always going to be innovation, and you're always looking beyond what you're currently doing. Yeah. And so, and, and that my set, the second thing is other than culture is giving time. It's funny we haven't realised this, but he's giving time to people, or even separating out uh, from the main. So if your business, the main business, but you want to explore whether there's any way to disrupt it, you separate out a team of people almost to, to, with the, with the uh, mandate yeah. to disrupt your existing business. But that's a very brave thing to do, and not many people do that. But that would be my other advice, is almost, you know, you have a bunch of four, four people in the basement, and you go, kill us. Find a way to kill us, because once we learn from you how you're going to kill us, we will then hopefully uh, avoid that from our competitors. But it's very hard to do. So the point here is every disruption from strategy. Every successful disruptive company yeah, eventually becomes the main becomes the main um, company or the main business, and that and you get a soft underbelly which will be disruptive or can be disruptive. Doesn't have, it won't necessarily be, but it can be. Well, and your business can become something completely different. Look, I mean, look at IBM. It's a completely different business now than it was 30 years ago. You know, it just it got severely disrupted, and it's you know it's actually thriving now, but in a completely different way. Nokia. You know, what are Nokia doing now is they, they got disrupted and they're, they're deceased, now, not disrupted. Well, they're now trying to work out how to, you know, disrupt other people. But it's we done? No, I have one more. more oh. yes. He went to Gold Star. Maybe you already mentioned it in the paper farm, but to, show you, to make some long story short, just tell what you're looking here. Maybe there are some startups, but they don't have proper English to speak out. But maybe they have bright ideas to sell to you. Or who are you and what you're doing here? And whether you're angel investor, equity investor, or just looking for inspiration and then returning back to doing it on local grounds. I think. I mean, as as a career, I'm not an investor. I mean, you know, we we have investments by business in in other businesses. We're always looking for new ideas. Um, uh, I, you know, we're we're here now to work with Happy Farm and mentor some of the great talent you have in Ukraine. It's my second time here. And, I've been unbelievably impressed with the work ethic, with the, uh, the, the skill base that you have. And I think it's just, um, if, if there's anything that, that I can bring to the party, it's just a little bit of um, maybe a, an older head with a lot of business experience um, in a variety of businesses, um, you know, to try and mold that. But of course, yeah, we work in, 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 in a field where, especially in Silicon Valley, you know, a, a, you know we, we where we know a lot of investors and we're always interested in, in new ideas. So, yeah, come talk to us. Any, any field at all. I mean, I, I specifically have a lot of experience in media, you know, and um, uh, in app development and in working with big brands. But, um, you know, I, I, I would, I've heard some amazing ideas at Happy Farm and everything from really great big data ideas to, uh, you know, to new disruptive technologies in you know, in the art world, for example, but, uh, you know, so, yeah, anything, anything that, that, that clearly has a problem that's being solved and a really good solution to get to it, always interested. And for me, it's two, it's probably two things. I mean, my, my, my um, if, if I could make a living from working just with startups, I would. So, so I get very excited of, of um, just a, talking to startups, but also trying to help them focus. I, I'm a big fan of focus, so that's something I learned myself, but I, I just as part of my, my um, makeup. So I, quite, I really enjoy sitting down and challenging the teams to focus, and hopefully out of the back of it, 
it, it helps them. But I can't make a living out of startups because I don't want to charge startups or I think it's pointless. You should, you know, they have no money, they, they need. So, you know, I have, a, I have an agency where I then advise bigger companies and that's how, how I make my money. And I've got one thing I didn't mention, which is relevant here, is that I uh, just kicked off a new business called Atlantic Leap. And Atlantic Leap, and that business looks after um, sort of B and C stage American companies who want to come to Europe and they want to expand into Europe. And they start in the UK, but very quickly they want to look to the rest of the continent. And um, we've already got two clients, and it's, it's, we knew that uh, it was something that Americans are very scared of ROW, rest of world. Uh, and uh, they they need uh, you know they know there's big opportunities um, in in the UK, but actually in your regions here there's big opportunities, but they are not that confident about it. So um, so to be honest, my, my hope here was a yes to meet and mentor uh, startups because I love doing that. So that that's I genuinely just love doing that. But actually, from a business perspective, I'm starting to think. If Atlantic Leap can help US companies come to the UK and mainland Europe, wouldn't it be great if we could also actually help introduce them to the right partners yeah. in these territories? And I know for sure from a business perspective that would be a very, uh, nobody does that, you know, in, in, and that would be very powerful. Now, I can't, I'm not an expert, so I can't do that yet, but hopefully I'll meet people who can help me maybe do that uh, within Ukraine, and, and I've, I've done some trips into Moscow as well to do, to do the same thing. Okay. Thank you very much for listening to us. I hope you Great presentation, inspiration, and of course, great email. Thank you so much.